All right, today we're going to talk about the impact of technology and how it affects uh, CO2 in the architecture of supermarket systems. And a lot of that has to do with trying to understand change and where the industry insight comes from. So when we talk about change, what is driving change? It could have to do with energy and what regulatory impact the Department of Energy has. It could have to do with the environmental part of it and where EPA is. But then how do all of these agencies affect the decisions that we make in choosing our systems architecture? Part of that can be the EPA and the SNAP and the new significant alternative policy, and that's part of the Clean Air Act. And we understand that they went ahead and looked at eliminating some higher GWP refrigerants. But that is also under question. So that brings into, you know, what can we do, what can't we do, what is going to be the outcome of the appeals is all up in limbo. But it all has to do with that change, and change is coming. Then we talk about not only from what's going to happen on the national level, but what can happen on the state level. So you take here, the California Air Resource Board did a, a strategy report, and, and basically they put a strategy and a business plan of how the state of California is going to address, address refrigerants and so forth. So you take a look at this big report and you go all the way to page 94, and in there they focus on refrigerants, that they've already approved that in 2020, in the state of California, you cannot use a refrigerant over 150 GWP. That's going to impact your long-term decision of what you need to do for your system's architecture. There's a lot more pending legislation coming. Don mentioned it a little bit today in our reference and so forth, and that there are a lot of things coming not only from an energy but from a refrigerant point of view. And as we talked about, CARB is out in front of it from a state level. Then we take a look at the refrigerants, and you know, we got rid of R22 as a refrigerant because of the ozone depleting factor. But what that did is forced us in the refrigerants that ended up having a higher GWP, which we looked at that a little bit differently with the global warming potential. And now with the pending regulations, that we want to move away from those and move into different A1 refrigerants. And what are our options? And part of that is how you need to distinguish what your current fleet of stores have and what you may want to do to get out in front of that. When you look at that, we can say, okay, GWP, those are HFCs. Because global warming potential is going to be an issue, we have to look at how that impacts our design. Then you can move to HFC, HFO blends, and that does lower your GWP, but it only does it moderately. What are the options that we have today for that? And that's a big reason why we look at natural refrigerants being CO2, ammonia, or even propane with restrictions on size amounts of how we can get out in front of that. So when we look at the refrigerants in itself, whether you're looking at a conventional DX system, a distributed, a cascade system, secondary system, booster system, and it even impacts where we are with self-contained. You have options based on where the refrigerants and what the technology is. So you might have to put a little bit more insight to what's happening in the industry and where do I need to be out in front of it? So when we look at that, you can have distributed systems and that reduces your refrigerant charge, whether it be an HFC or so forth, by putting the capacity closer to the load. That does help. You can also move to an HFO, further reducing your global warming impact on your refrigeration system. Then we've also been able to do secondary systems, which glycol was a great introduction for our marketplace of using a secondary refrigerant to reduce HFCs within the store. We can also do that with CO2 on the low end. Then we have Cascade further reducing the HFC charge within a store, but also gives us the ability on the high side of the Cascade to do something with the natural refrigerant, either being ammonia or 290 in modules. Booster system. That allows us to have 100% natural refrigerant solution without having to worry about any HFC, HFOs. And as I was also mentioned today, we have micro distributor, which is kind of a plug and play where we have individual condensing units on every case with a glycol loop around the store that allows us to reduce our refrigerant per charge per case. And hopefully soon we'll have long-term solutions with that with either propane or CO2 as a natural refrigerant. So you have choices. And part of what we're going to look at today is what is the impact of CO2, not only on the environment, but on your system. And when we look at it from the environment impact, 
CO2 is a zero ozone depleting factor and it has a one GWP. It is a future proof solution to your long-term plans. You will not have to retrofit out of CO2. Then you look at the efficiency of CO2. Because CO2 is more efficient, it has more cooling capacity. And after all, that's why we have refrigerant. Refrigerant is to move the heat from where we don't want it to where we can get rid of it in the atmosphere. And by doing that, we can do it more efficiently with CO2, especially in a cooler climate. So that gives us the ability to have smaller compressors, more efficiency, have smaller line sizes. We'll be able to reduce your installation cost. And then it gives us the ability to look at less refrigerant within the store as well. So the CO2 booster system is really a traditional DX system. It does have a few things that make it different, but it does give us the ability to have 100% CO2 within the system. So when we look at those differences, you have your gas cooler. We call it a gas cooler because in a CO2 system, the critical point of CO2 is 85 degrees. At 85 degrees and above, you can't fully condense the CO2, so therefore we will be cooling the condenser cooling the gas and that gives us the ability through that to do a gas cooler versus a condenser. Then you have a high pressure control valve. In a traditional DX system, that's a holdback valve. Now we're just going to do it electronically to monitor and fluctuate that pressure coming back from the gas cooler. Your flash tank, same as a receiver today, it's just rated to handle a little bit more pressure because of CO2. One thing that is different than a traditional system is we have a flash gas bypass valve. What that allows us to do is that when we build up and we're not fully condensing that CO2 coming back from the gas cooler, it allows us to take that vapor on top of your flash tank and put it back into the system and recycle it so that we always have liquid CO2 for refrigeration. And again, the net last change would be that you have to use electronic expansion valves and case controllers. Now that does add to your capital cost, but it also increases the performance of your cases your superheat, et cetera. So that has to be considered when you do the evaluation and comparison. CO2 systems are growing, and that trend is gonna to continue to grow because it's giving an alternative solution when you look at natural refrigerants. So we look at growth, just, you know, Europe is where it really started. It's, a, it's got a majority of the market share in Europe, but even in the United States and North America, we see that growth coming. And then we can expand that from just 2013 to now 2017 of having over 300 systems, transcritical CO2 systems in North America operating. So it is not new technology, it's already being applied. So we look at that, not only do we have that whole thing of CO2 is only a cool weather option, we also have it available in warmer climates. Now there's some things we have to do with that. We have over 60 locations in what we would consider warm climate. Now what we would do on those is, instead of having an air-cooled gas cooler, we now have adiabatic. And if you're not familiar with adiabatic, we run the adiabatic dry when the ambient is outside of 85 degrees. When it gets above 85 degrees, we then wet the pads. And by doing that, we pull the air across these wet pads, bringing that temperature about two degrees off a wet bulb, and that allows us to further condense CO2 even in a warmer climate and we've been very, very successful with that application. Have parallel compression and gas ejectors. They can be done individually, they can be done in parallel. Parallel compressors basically is we add a compressor at a higher suction group, and that's how we process the gas instead of going through the bypass valve. It allows us to process that gas more efficiently. We have ejectors. Ejectors are basically taking chilled CO2 off the medium temp suction, putting it into the return from the gas cooler, which allows us to reduce the temperature of that CO2 coming back and staying in a subcritical operation, and that's the important part on the efficiency side. So there are solutions for warm climates. We have an example here of Sprouts. A couple years ago, they did the adiabatic store in Dunwoody, Georgia. Very, very successful, very happy with it. We just recently opened up another store over in Woodstock where we have parallel compression and ejectors installed. So there are ways to handle CO2 in warm climates that make it affordable and efficient. Affordable, costs coming down. We have more and more components. We have more and more 
OEMs involved, we have more warehouses involved, contractors are being trained so we get lower installed costs, but our costs are coming down. We've been able to use high pressure copper now instead of steel piping. So from a manufacturing point of view, we can reduce our cost, reducing your original investment. But when we talk about that, the challenges we always have is capital costs. It costs more. And sometimes it does, but I think we're closing the gap on that. Availability of refrigeration contractors with the fact that we have over 300 stores in North America, more and more contractors are getting familiar with installing it. So it's not the, I don't know, bid high. It's I understand, can bid low. And then the impact on performance. Yes, warm climates impact the efficiency of a system. But as I've shown you, we have technology that will advance that forward that'll make it less climate impact. Then we have a lot of benefits that we can calculate. Hey, we're gonna have a reduced charge because of CO2, so we'll have less refrigerant charge, less cost. We'll have refrigeration insulation, as I discussed. We'll have lower, smaller sizes of pipe, meaning less hangers, easy to install. And things that we can calculate, performance of the EEVs. If we're controlling the superheat of the case to maintain that one degree differential, we'll perform better and we'll have better product safety versus a mechanical valve that may fluctuate a little bit more. Intangible benefits. Those are things that I don't think our crystal ball, your crystal ball could ever calculate, but have to be considered when you look at doing a comparison. Cost avoidance. If you do CO2, you will not have to retrofit it. If you do another HFC, HFO today, will you have to retrofit that depending on what comes down the road for legislation? Relief for record keeping. You know, don't have the issue with CARB. Saving on a PM program. If part of your preventive maintenance program is your contract provides you refrigerant, if he's putting in CO2, there's less of it and it's cheaper. Therefore, you have less risk under your management program. So those are things that you really have to consider. So when we look at that, that we look at what, are, what is your first cost and what is what would be considered a total cost of ownership. So you, when you look at your costs, your capital costs may go up, but then maybe your installation and maintenance costs come down. How do you take that into effect and look at that and compare it? Energy evaluation, refrigerant management, as I mentioned, your impact on environment. Can you go to your retail base and your customer and say, we built an environmentally friendly store and does that bring you value within your marketplace? But you have to understand the ROI and how that impacts your total cost of ownership. And what I mean by that is if you take a system and you look at what you're spending, my first cost, that's all I need to do, and I'm looking at that and that's going to be your decision maker, you have to look at total cost of ownership. And what that means is that there are more things that impact our decision making. Yes, capital cost is part of that, but it's not the only thing. What's it cost to install it? What's it cost to maintain it? What's my energy cost going to be? Then you start looking at total cost of ownership, and then you say, what am I saving? And one thing you have to look at when you do a comparison is your capital cost investment is usually one time. But when you look at total cost of ownership, your savings could be annually. And how does that impact your long-term business plan? And how do you turn your company profitable? So when you look at that, if you just look at capital costs, what the cost of the equipment is, this, this example here, $200,000 more, he may not make that decision. But when you look at installed cost and how that may affect it, so you take an installed cost, and because we know refrigerant's going to be less, installation's going to be less, electrical's going to be less, because if we're charging you more for a case controller, can we save you on the installation because it's a single point electrical connection? So when you look at it from that point of view, your differential installed before you open your first register is now only 3%. You're looking at the bigger picture. Then, if you ever were able to get utility incentive or you look at your annual operating costs because we're gonna save energy, this may be a cooler climate location, so we're saving some energy, we're saving some on refrigerant management. That gives you a financial statement a 2.5 years. Are you looking at today or are you looking at tomorrow? Can you make a better financial decision on what your designs are going to be? It's important to understand that. When we say game changers, 
We have SMUD in Northern California. It's a utility company that is now looking at working with retailers to give incentives to natural refrigerants. The days of the low-hanging fruit of LED lighting and ECM motors are gone because those are now standard as far as compliant for Department of Energy regulations. So can you get with your local utility, no matter where it is, and help offset your first cost with incentives? Because change is coming. Actually, change is already here. We know that. You need to be forward thinking of how you can get out in front of that. And having the right information and looking at the bigger picture can make the difference in you making the best financial decision long term. So I want to recap just a few things to make a focal point. Change is here, as I mentioned. Can you make a good business decision by looking at the bigger picture? Yeah, we have some low HFO, GWP options that will give you something short term, but there are available in the marketplace. There may be new approved refrigerants soon. The trend is to natural refrigerants, and this is not just in Europe. It's happened across North America, as we've shown you, and it's going to impact a lot in what's going on in California. Looking past first cost, you don't have to make first cost your only decision. Look at total cost of ownership, and that'll put you in the best place to make the best decision, no matter what it is. It's important to know the bigger picture. I thank you for your time, and do we have any more questions?